so so okay everybody today i have someone that that i just shared a real embarrassing story with who, who took me back almost 30 years in my life i have the one and only amazing guy the one and only mr chris mordeski formerly known as the masterpiece of wwe um chris still got it you still got it you still got it and let me just tell you something chris and i didn't tell you this beforehand um because i, I couldn't have said this twice so today i was talking to my mother and yep. my mother was asking me who are you talking to today and i said i will send you a picture so i sent her a picture and she's like oh Wow. Uh, 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 really? <laughs> Tell me you're taping this, right? I'm like, I'm never talking to you again. Get away from me. She's been texting me since nine o'clock in the morning in Toronto. Has he been on? Has he been on? Is there going to be video? Like, this is, this is embarrassing, right? So when my mother hears this, Ma, I'm never telling you again who I'm talking to. So, done. Well, you know what? Just tell mom I said hi and that uh, I'm extremely flattered. <laughs> God bless you, Chris. I, 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 I'm sending you a hug. God bless you. Chris, I, I, I want to thank you again for taking the time to come on our pod. I know you only have a little bit of time to chat with us today, and, and there's so much that, that I want to talk to you about. Um, sure. and, and we're going to try and cram it in in just a short amount of time here. But, you know, you, you've been a professional athlete and, and entertainer, but professional athlete for almost 20 years now. And, and, and yeah. I'm, kind of, I'm kind of wondering, Chris, like, like what, what were you doing like, as an athlete before you became a professional wrestler? Uh, well, you know, I started out so early in my um, journey in professional wrestling that like I wasn't really doing anything um, spectacular beforehand. Like I, I'm not like Kurt Angle or Shelton Benjamin. I didn't come up with a, a collegiate or amateur wrestling background or anything like that. I was just always kind of the, uh, you know, I like you and a lot of wrestling fans. I was an obsessed fan as a kid. I loved it my whole life. So I pretty much discovered really early on when I was maybe about 15 years old that what I wanted to do was pro wrestling. So, um, you know, I started taking steps towards moving in that direction. Um, I did have, you know, when I did get, start getting bigger, I was getting recruited by the high school football team, uh, obviously, because a lot of people thought I was a narc because I got to the point where I put on so much weight and I looked older. You know what I mean? I looked like I was in my 20s. So it was, you know, the last couple of years in high school were pretty funny. But uh, outside of that, I mean, I did play some water polo and, you know, but none of this uh, in any serious fashion. Um, I'm obsessed with basketball, although I can't play it worth a damn. And uh, yeah, man, it, but it was pretty much, yeah, wrestling was the main focus. So I, I really just kind of took up uh, kind of like, like took up bodybuilding essentially when I was about 15 or 16 years old. Because, uh, you know, I had seen all the guys like we were talking about earlier, you know, you've seen the guys in pro wrestling like the Hulk Hogan's Ultimate Warriors and all that. So I just tried to take whatever steps I could towards that. Chris, I, I got to believe with, with your frame, you're 6'4". And, and, and yeah. let's tell me you were a guy that grew a lot later in life. Um, I got to believe in high school, you had every coach drooling every time you walked down the hallway. Like you, you oh, yeah. A pretty big well, guy. The, well, I mean, I know the football coach. Yeah, like every time I'd see and this was a, this was maybe in the tenth grade, so that was uh, my second year in high school. Because you know, that's when I really kind of started putting on a lot of weight. I started working out like crazy, and uh, you know, somebody gave me the advice um, because I was a real skinny kid. I was tall, but I was skinny, very lanky. So um, you know, somebody gave me the advice to just you know eat, eat, and eat some more. And, you know, I really took that to heart. So, I mean, I would work out every day, but I would also eat like a madman. I was taking in like thousands upon thousands of calories and uh, it worked out. I mean, granted, I did get, you know, after about a year and a half of that, I was close to 300 pounds and my cheeks were out to here and I had a tire around my waist. So, I mean, yeah, like I put on the weight, but, you know, that was kind of part of the plan as I got to that point And then I had to, uh, you know, kind of switch and go the other way and start dieting and watching what I ate and doing more cardiovascular conditioning. And then once I went about that process, uh, you know, I was caring about at least, you know, I went from weighing like 190 to weighing about 235, 240. Uh, so, you know, once I dieted down from 300, so, and I dieted down from 300 over a span of like three months. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of my process. How old were you when you hit 300 pounds? 
Um, probably I'm um, 18. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Talk. Yeah, I started at about 16 and a half or maybe 17. And then like, so throughout that whole year, I mean, what I would do is, is I just learned that you need to eat several times a day. But on top of that, like in high school, for instance, they would give you these little cartons of milk with your breakfast and lunch. But what I would do, because I saw that, oh, milk is a great source of protein, it's got this and that, is I would steal about four or five of them every breakfast or lunch. So I would eat the meal and then I would drink all that milk on top of it. So you can imagine, like, I was taking in a ridiculous amount of calories. And I was doing that every day. Like, at school, I would do it twice a day. You know, I, you know, people used to make fun of me for the fact that I would have all these milk cartons at my desk. <laughs> yeah. I got to believe that you brought tears to the eyes of the football coach just watching you walk by. I mean... He just laughed at me. Every time he saw me, he would look at me and give me this look, and he would either... Uh, chuckle a bit or you would like you know uh duck his head down and start shaking it like this you know what i mean out of you know signifying a uh, lost opportunity so to speak oh god for him for him i mean it, for you who knows but it, that, that would have just been incredible well so so now you embark upon the, this this career now and, and again you're going on almost 20 years of, of an amazing career that you've kept going buddy What's been the toughest part for you in, in, in your specific world? Because yours is so different from any other professional sport. Um, yeah, you know, there's a few factors that stand out. I don't know if there's any one thing. I mean, you could always argue the first thing that comes to mind, especially when you're with WWE, is the amount of travel. But um, for me, that's kind of part I love about the job most nowadays. And it wasn't always like that, but... Uh, you know, I enjoy waking up in a different place every day. I enjoy seeing different places. And it's just become so much a part of my root weekly routine that, uh, you know, if I just stay in one place for the week, I almost get a little uh, stir crazy. So, um, but I mean, that also is very difficult because we're talking, uh, you know, especially at that point, you know, you're flying, you know, living on the West Coast, you're always flying to the East Coast, which is, you know, completely throws your sleep, sleep off. And then, trying to eat properly on the road, <clears throat> that kind of stuff is difficult, you know what I mean? Because you're always on the go. So you have to come up with these, uh, you know, like routines or kind of little systems you, you put in place on the road where you eat at these type of places. And then finding a gym is difficult. And then, you know, in terms of the wrestling itself, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, I love doing it, you know what I mean? But if you were going to look at any, um, bad side to it, I guess <clears throat> it would be obviously the physical abuse you take over time. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm physically fine still to this day. You know, I've had all kinds of injuries, but uh, yeah, knock on wood, right? Uh, and, you know, in, in wrestling, just like any other kind of line of work, you know, there's a certain degree of politics. You know what I mean? It's not like when you're, I'm going out there and wrestling somebody, I can just go out and like beat them with my talent because what we're doing is a show, it's predetermined. So, you know, so that aspect can be difficult as well. So, like, I would I would kind of wrap up all those little things into one ball and say, you know, that kind of sums it up. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more, but uh, just off the top of my head. Oh, my God. I mean, but what you've just listed right now, I, I mean, there's, there's so many people that couldn't even understand what, what, what you go through. I mean, like, yeah, like every week, every week on the WWE, uh, somebody said this and I can't remember who, but like every time you go through, like we would travel, like I would fly out to a town on Friday morning, uh, get to the town, wrestle, and then we would drive to another place Saturday, wrestle, drive to another place Sunday, wrestle, and then drive to another place Monday and then do TV. And then you would go home. So you'd be home about two and a half days. And, uh, um, you know, what I'm getting at is it just, you know, you would be, you're just constantly on the go. You know what I mean? It's like every time you get through a week on the road, it would feel like this huge monumental task. Like, oh, wow, I got it through uh, 800 miles of driving and 10 hours of flying and four matches. You know what I mean? It's just so much happens in that little block of time that, you know, and you don't even really have time to reflect because you get home, you got to rest and then you're at it again. So like, life, you know, a decade went by like that with that company. A decade going by like that. I mean, I, I can't even imagine what it's like for you to, to actually have to drive after you've just 
I that might be the worst part. You know, come to think of it, you know, the flights are never fun, but you know, some of the drives are just so long after these, uh, you know, we work a show and we would just have like, just so much driving and you know, it starts wearing at your body sitting, you know, you maybe took a couple bad bumps that night or something. So I think the driving probably is the most challenging part. Not that um, road trips aren't fun with your boys, but it's just like, you know, on a four day trip, you'd get, by the time you get to Sunday and you've already been in the car for like 10 hours, uh, like at that point it gets difficult. I, I, I remember what it was like as, as a hockey player doing the 12 hour bus rides and you're trying to lick your wounds on the way back, right? And, and there's, yeah. no, there's no comfortable spot. I remember actually finding comfort lying down on the floor. And well, yeah, I, I see that. Yeah. I, can't, I can't even imagine what you're going through where not only do you have to get to that next destination, but then you've got to get on cue again. You've got to get yeah. on cue again, right? And, and yeah. I can't even imagine what that's like for you. Every yeah, the day, the day flying in was always the difficult. You know, that first show, like, you know, I said I'd fly out on a Friday. That first show was always the most difficult. It was like, all right, just get through this one, you know, get a good night of rest, and then you kind of reset for the weekend type thing. So, uh, you know, that day was, I mean, Monday TV days are always difficult because they were long days, you know, like the other shows are called um, live events or house shows. So you just need to get there within an hour of the show. You uh, work and then you leave. On Mondays, it's a whole nother a whole nother thing like you got to get there at noon and you're there for literally about 10 hours and you're you know you're spending your whole day there and you're shooting pre-tapes you're uh you know assigned a match for the night uh all of that but um you know friday was really just the write-off it was like all right get through this one do the best you can uh, you know and get some rest <laughs> so so i w when you get there chris and, 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 and you you're getting ready for for the day though what I want to talk about now is that, that mental side. So, so like for yeah. us, headset sports, right? We talk about the mental side of the game, right? We talk about the mental side of, of how professionals and elite athletes like yourself have to strap that bucket on and, and get in the game. And, and, and I'm just sitting there thinking like, oh my God, the mileage you would put on your body physically driving. And then you got to get to an event, a venue, check in, and now you got to figure out who you're going to be basically mangling that night and how it's going to go. And then get that guy on board with you. Like mentally, what's going through your head to get yourself ready for all of this? Uh, you know, that's the easiest part usually, unless you got a bad dance partner. You know, when I show up to the building, it's not like, uh, you know, after a certain point when you've been doing this, especially with certain people, you know, like if they – if I show up to a building and I know, for example, like Drew McIntyre, he's the world champion right now. If I know I got Drew McIntyre that night, he's, uh, he's a good buddy of mine. I've traveled with him before. We've had great matches together. He's very physical. So I would know that, okay, I'm probably going to get beat up a little bit tonight, but uh, I'm going to have a great match and I got a good dance partner. So I really there, you know, it's everything else that is uh, more difficult you know what i mean like as far as who you're working i mean unless again unless you're in there with somebody who's reckless or even somebody you just don't have chemistry with or don't like which doesn't happen too often you know what i mean like you know for the most part you know there's a brotherhood amongst the crew and you know obviously everybody's not friends but um you know a lot of the people that i had to work i had at least some kind of bond with and uh that was the fun part of the job. I mean, that's what it's all about to perform in front of a live crowd to work against somebody you either have respect for or one of your buddies and go out there and just dance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not some big thing too that we need to walk through or anything. You know what I mean? A lot of times with guys, once they're good enough, I mean, we can just go out there and dance. Like we don't need to go into the ring and go over a million things. We just go out there and do it. We maybe bounce some ideas off each other. Um, at most maybe walk through a, a, a maneuver or something like that if necessary but outside of that man it's you know and that's actually one of the fun parts too is um what i really love about wrestling nowadays is the creative process of it of sitting down with a guy and figuring out what's the tr the story we're trying to tell you know what i mean and is it i'm the bigger stronger heel and you're the quicker faster baby face or is it the uh, technician versus the high flyer and then once you figure that out, like figuring out what pieces fit into the puzzle, like, okay, well, who's going over? And then how do we get there? Like the creative process, it's like, you know, it's like being, a, a, you know, writing a movie almost or, you know, directing a movie, so to speak, or um, 
you know. That, that, that this is like beyond amazing, Chris. Like what, what you're sharing with us is like, oh yeah. my, I, I yeah. feel like, like you're kind of taking the, 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 the tarp or the curtain back and we're seeing the Wizard of Oz. Like, like you, you're, oh, well nowadays, you know, nowadays everybody knows it's a show, you know what I mean? Like, but I mean, granted, I don't like it when wrestling is disrespected. Like some people will call it fake and that feels kind of like a slap in the face because every, everything we do is physical. Like, you know what I mean? Like this is a physical line of work. It's not for, uh, you know, it's not ballet. So, um, you know, I always felt that it's just like people who call it fake are not taking that um, into account. You know what I mean? Like the steel chair shots, we don't do them anymore, but those are real. You know, like when you glom somebody in the back, like you're really bringing it. I mean, when you have guys that are as big as you slamming into each other and, and landing on concrete, I, I I don't know if it's maybe I'm getting older, but oh my God, whether it's staged or not staged, it's choreographed, not choreographed. You're falling on concrete. That, yeah. that 300 pound guy is falling on you. And I know what my knees feel like. I can't imagine what it's been like for you and your colleagues. And, and, and when you guys get thrown into a corner, like that ring doesn't move. And yeah, it, well, that, that's what I was going to say. The biggest misconception, and I, that's a great point about that corner. Yeah, that corner is stiff. So when you see somebody taking a hard buckle, uh, you know, that's not soft. And then at another, I was going to say, the big misconception was a lot of people, um, you know, not people who watch wrestling. I think most people who are, are hardcore wrestling fans know otherwise, but um, the mat is not soft. You know what I mean? A lot of people think it's got all this give to it and like, it is not soft, you know what I mean? That is, uh, I mean, it's built in a way that, and it's got springs in it so we won't get injured, but still, when you're taking a backdrop or any kind of bump on that, like, you feel it. You know, buddy, I will say this. Um, one of the things that, that I, I once said to someone who was making fun of my sport growing up, which is, which is hockey, yeah. you know, I, I, re, I, I relate a lot of what you do to hockey in that our two sports are ones that you cannot run out of bounds on. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, oh, you, there's no out of bounds. Yeah, there's, there's no, no out of bounds, bounds to stop play. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Game's not <laughs> over because I choose to, to walk out of bounds, right? It, it, it oh, is. yeah, that's, that's a pretty cool observation. I like that. I never really thought about that. And I just, I just think about what, what your scenario is each and every, every night. Each and every night you're engaging. And, and, and I guess I, I got to wonder, like, you've done a really nice job at explaining that, you know, for the most part, there's, I love that term brotherhood you brought up and, and you get along. But w when you have scenarios that are presented to you that maybe were ones that, you know, you weren't looking forward to or you were surprised, like maybe I thought I, 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 I'm doing well lately. Maybe I thought it would be my turn to win tonight. And that gets thrown in a different direction for you. What was that like mentally? Like, did you have to recreate a scenario to feel pumped again to get back in there? Like, that's kind of uh, tough, Chris. Well, I mean, here was my uh, approach to that type of stuff. Because, yeah, there was people that I've had to lose to that I didn't necessarily want to or that I didn't. I felt like it was a waste of a loss, no disrespect to anybody. But for me, it was more – it wasn't as much about – with pro wrestling and me, it's not as much about – who wins or loses, although granted in some situations that really, really matters. But for me, it was all about the performance. It was like, okay, even if I am going to lose, let me make the most of our five to 10 minutes that we have out there. Like, let me get myself over despite the fact that I like, let me get over in loss, which is completely possible. If you're going out there and you're giving it your all and you understand psychology and you understand how to sell and you're able to get the crowd involved and like, like, if you're bringing all that to the table, you can still come out of a match that you're losing and still, uh, you know, with the fans having a higher opinion of you than uh, before so. So, I mean, that, that's just, that's kind of how I mentally always approached it. And because uh, it's a good point what you're saying. For a lot of guys, it can be difficult when you're coming into a line of work where you're told you have to lose. Like, there's a lot of egos involved. And then, you know, especially you got guys who, who have athletic backgrounds who are coming from the fighting world or anything like that. So for them, it's like it completely goes against everything, you know, they've ever trained for to just, you know, to, you know, prep for a match and then go out there and uh, purposely have to lose. But, I mean, with pro wrestling, it really more so than the wins or losses, just it comes down to the performance. Like, what are you able to invoke out of the audience while you're out there? 
But, but you know, Chris, I mean, you, you, you say it in such a professional way. And, and, and yeah. I mean, you, you're a consummate pro to the point where, like, I mean, oh, my God, you, I don't even know what to say to you because I want to stick my finger down my throat here because it's like I can't believe how, how good of a guy you are. For, yeah. me, for, for, for me, I don't know how I would, would go about being able to have a career as long as yours when I've had situations like you said, hey, listen, you know what? Today you're, you're going to you know, not win tonight. You're, you're, this guy's going to yeah. take you. Because, I mean, I, I've had the chance to see, to see you on, on TV. And, oh, my God, you would never, ever, ever know that there was a moment that you were pissed off, frustrated, and, like, you know, you're going to kick the can because it wasn't yeah. your way. So, yeah. to me, you're almost like a hero to kids because you went out of your way in many ways. And I know you're a pro and you're getting paid for this, but you truly went out of your way to make that experience really fun for those kids and those fans. Yeah. Yeah. And that can't be easy, man. That can't oh, yeah. be easy. I, 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 and I, 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 don't, I, I would think that just as much as, as being thrown in the turnbuckle or thrown on the concrete floor, after a while, it's got to wear on you. I would think, at least for me, it would. Uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it does, even if you're not necessarily conscious of it. But again, like I try to go back to when I was just watching wrestling and as, as a fan. and. Uh, for me, it was all about like, it wasn't really like when I watched Shawn Michaels, for instance, oh. it wasn't necessarily about like Shawn Michaels is a guy who, uh, granted, he's won a lot of matches, but he didn't necessarily have to win to be the best wrestler on the card or even to get the, uh, you know, to steal the show, so to speak. So like, you know, when you look at like WrestleMania 10, for instance, like Shawn loses to Razor Ramon in the ladder match. But, like, who's really made out of it? Like, you know, Razor, is sure, is still the champ and everything. But I think in that loss, Shawn Michaels kind of proved that he was the number one performer on the show. So I always kind of look to situations like that and be like, okay, you know what I mean? Like, that's the goal. That's the objective. I mean, it's, it's always to help get the person you're working over, too, or at least in most situations. But, you know, I have control over how – you know, I can make this match look over how I can sell different things in the match, how I can, uh, you know, all of that type of stuff, the facials, the drama, all of that yeah. stuff is within my power. So, so let, let me, let me maybe throw you under the bus on this one. Um, mm -hmm. So, so knowing what you have to balance, there's a lot of psychology to this. There's a lot, but you also have to be an, an elite level athlete. To, to do this, and especially for you to last as long as you, you last, you still look in amazing condition as you do right now. Would you consider yourself more a pro athlete or a professional entertainer? Oh, definitely a hybrid of both. You know what I mean? Like I, yeah. I'm definitely an athlete and I've always felt like I was a, a good athlete, especially for my size. Like not everybody when you're six foot four, 270 can uh, necessarily move around. I mean, granted, I'm not going to be a guy who's doing a bunch of flips or anything like that. You know what I mean? I've never really saw that as part of my game, but I, I really just think it's a combination of both. It's uh, actually one of the most unique combinations of both you'll find in any line of work because, you know, I grew up out here in Los Angeles. So I started out in actually uh, acting and modeling when I was a young kid going into like, you know, just before I turned into a teenager. So, I mean, for me, it's always, you know, even if it wasn't wrestling, for me, I think my, I feel like my calling is always some type of performance. Um, it is wrestling, though, that really grabbed me and I was, I, you know, was obsessed about and I wanted to do. But um, yeah, to me, it just feels like you're, yeah, you're a combination of both. You're, you're an athlete, you're a performer. You know what, how I explain it to a lot of people I work nowadays and stuff like that, too, is the wrestling ring is like theater. You know what I mean? And that, that is your theater. And that, you know, that ring is center stage and to kind of, you know, look at it like that. So, you know, you're not just going out there and executing moves. You know, you understand that this is a show, um, it's theater, this is center stage, and you kind of understand what goes along with that. It's a performance and there's a lot more to a performance than just, you know, striking somebody. So, buddy, with all the things that you've done and in, in, in the longevity of your career, and you're still doing it now, what's been the biggest challenge? that you've had to face in your career? Um, the biggest challenge. 
you know, one of the biggest difficulties for me was always like when I started my wrestling journey, I was too like, I was probably 280 and 290 pounds. So I was like, just, I was like the size of Thor. So one of the big challenges has always been to try to stay close to that shape because that was kind of like, I set the bar really high for myself. So, you know, anytime I'm not somewhere close to that range, you know what I mean? I'll either get, you know, I'll have guys messing with me or, you know, it just, it, it's always been a big deal. It's like, you know, like being compared to the best version of yourself. So that's kind of one, been one of the more difficult, and not because I, I do love working out, but it's just as time goes on and injuries occur and all that, it's just, you know, it's hard. And especially being built as the masterpiece Chris Masters, right? Like, you know, that sets the bar really high. Like you got to look good. You know what I mean? And no pressure there. So, no pressure well, there. Yeah. I mean, Grant, again, I love working out, so it's not a problem for me to work out and everything, but for me to carry that amount of weight for uh, an extended period of time is much more difficult. So let me ask you this, right? I'm going to go right off the rails on this one, right? I mean, your, your, your last name, you, you're, you're, definitely not, uh, you, you're definitely not afraid of European food, I'm thinking. So what has diet been like for you? throughout all this like is diet as big of a thing that we've got throughout to throughout since i started wrestling or in quarantine <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question that's a good question let, let, well let, let's go both because because that's going to dovetail into the end here yeah so let's go both what's it been like well, I, I, I diet? Think, well, eating is not that difficult for me at least because when you're looking at when you approach food as a you know a lot of people approach food like as in food like they you know they want to eat but for me i've tried at least for the most part in my life tried to approach uh, food as it's um as what it is it's fuel you know what i mean and there's only certain types of fuel i i want to put in my body you know what i mean i need to get this or i need to get that you know protein or uh, fibrous vegetables stuff like that so for me what it does is it really kind of narrows down my shopping list a lot you know what I mean? Because there's only like maybe, you know, two handfuls of things that I can really technically get at the grocery store. And again, I'm avoiding all the stuff in boxes pretty much in the center of the store. So I'm just working my way around the produce and the meat. And uh, I mean, but like, so that's in terms of broth. You're in terms of my mind. Food. I've never heard that before in my life. I, uh, I, could, I could end up make myself look like the biggest moron on the planet right now, Chris. But you just taught us all something. I never in my life heard anyone say something as smart as what you just said about diet, the outside. And now oh, yeah. I'm thinking of my Vons, I'm thinking of my Ralphs, people north of the border, if it's your Dominion, your Loblaws, your, all those places. Oh my God. The, the, you know what? This is like wrestling. You got to stay from the, away from the middle of the ring. That's uh, what it no, is. You, no, you want to stay outside. <laughs> Actually, actually, in the ring, the place you want to work the most is the center of the ring. Because, like, for instance, if you give a person a body slam and it's closer to the ropes, it's much more stiff there and has no give, and it'll probably make your opponent pissed off with you. Like, I know if somebody just slammed me towards the side of the ring, it would be like, what the hell are you doing, man? But, um, I mean, that's just a broad look at my diet when I'm uh, – but, like, in terms of being on the road, it's a whole different story. You know what I mean? Like, if you really want to, like – stick to like whatever your diet is or you want to be really good you go on you prep your food and then you bring some tupperware with you on the road but that's the most extreme case you know most of us at least for me personally like i like when i'm on the road to um actually going out to eat as part of the, the fun it's part of the social ex uh, experience and all that you know it's a time for you like hey you know after a show let's man let's go get dinner at this spot you know we'll go there we'll chill out for a while and then we'll start our three-hour drive and we'll you know we'll bs and stuff like that but um, yeah, and like, and another thing with on the road is so like outside of, you know, bringing Tupperware, I mean, it really just comes down to like, you have your certain spots you like to go, like maybe you go to Subway for lunch, which we did a lot because it was convenient and we were in a rush. Or in the morning, you know, you have these breakfast places you like, like, you know, and I'm not saying these are the most, most healthy spots, but like IHOP would be a big thing for us on the road for breakfast, uh, mm. the Waffle House was a huge thing and uh you know waffle house is not good but i don't know something about it once you've been on the road for a while you come to embrace it you know what i mean it's like because it's always open and it's a place you can get steak and eggs at any point so that you know i'll always opt for that over like some mcdonald's or burger king so i mean you know 
that's the biggest obstacle on the road is trying to avoid eating fast food because of, you know, you're either short on time or there's nothing else around. So, I mean, there's just, there comes a lot of situations where you're in the boonies and you're in the middle of nowhere. And like, even when I was just in Barbados, I was in Barbados before this whole coronavirus started. And man, the, the options for food on that island were uh, slim to none, man. Like they just, they don't have a lot of spots. I mean, we ended up eating at this kind of bad uh, um, chain restaurant they have there. It was like a step down from McDonald's. So, I mean, you get put, you know, you get put in a lot of situations like that where, uh, you know, you're just looking for something to eat because you're starving at this point and you're just going and work with whatever's in the town. You, you make me feel so good, Chris, knowing that you have a couple of weak spots. So, so that oh, makes yeah. me feel good uh, you're part uh, uh, right now. So you make me feel good. Now, now you kind of breezed over this really quick. Any, any injuries? Any, any worrisome injuries in your career? The last, well, the last major injury I had was just about three years ago. I had an ACL, which is a pretty devastating injury, as you probably know. Yeah, like I was working a match in Mexico, and it just it, we were doing some spot where I was picking up two of, two of my opponents at the same time, and my knee just buckled under the pressure. You know what I mean? I think there was uh, the weight distribution was obviously off. One guy was heavier than the other. The feeding of uh, the feed timing was off, so I mean, it just buckled, and then uh, yeah, I had to have surgery on that, and you know, that was about a six to twelve month deal, you know, getting over that. So I mean, I've had that, I've had, um, I fractured my ankle, I've had uh, muscle tears, you know, uh, I've had concussions and uh, dislocated elbow, which was a crazy injury. It popped up into my tricep. Oh. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they start to add up after a while. But, you know, um, again, nothing, you know, overly serious. And, again, knock on wood, but, uh, you know, it's just been a little bit here, a little bit there, you know. And uh, I wish I could have been like Jericho. You know, I think Chris Jericho has never been hurt in his whole wrestling. Really? Uh, never? Uh, uh, you know, I don't think – nothing serious. Like, he might have had one injury, but um, – I don't even think he's ever had a surgery. You know, the guy's just built like a freaking barrel. You know what I mean? He's just oh. thick. So, so, buddy, I, I know you, you don't have much time. So I want to ask you this. Yep. What's going on now? What, what, what can you tell us that's going on now in your career and, 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 and whatnot? Oh, uh, yeah, man. Well, I just, you know, I was living in Toronto, actually, uh, coincidentally. Yeah, I lived up in Toronto in your parts, uh, right over by Etobicoke. I met... Um, a nice woman up there. Uh, she actually used to be in pro wrestling, Tiana Ringer. And uh, so I, I moved from Los Angeles to Toronto for a good three years and uh, battled the stove with all you good, all you good Canadians up there. And uh, we just got back to LA like last September. So what I've been trying to do since I've been back, I mean, I'm continuing to wrestle still. It's still my primary, uh, primary job, essentially, is I usually work uh, once a week or twice a week, every weekend, like, uh, you know, throughout this, this whole coro coronavirus was devastating because I was set last month to go to Australia and Singapore and uh, actually Halifax. I had a couple bookings in Halifax. Really? So, uh, but I mean, outside of whatever wrestling uh, I was doing or I'm going to do after this is over, I mean, I came back to LA just to start getting involved. First of all, I'm finishing because I didn't finish high school. That's a little detail I, I, I missed out. I didn't finish high school. So, I'm just working on finishing my education and getting a GED. And I'm also, uh, you know, in the process, or I was in the process at least of acquiring an agent out here and just going out for various uh, commercial and acting work, you know, just whatever, even stunt work, just whatever, you know. And one other thing I've been looking at too, which goes in with the education is uh, broadcasting. I love uh, talking about politics. I love talking about sports, basketball, even wrestling. So, um, and like you see a lot of the, uh, you know, the podcasts and radio shows nowadays and the, um, you know, what I just, you know, all this stuff. And then even like my buddy Tyrus, who's on Fox News, he actually works on Fox News and he's a contributor for that station on like uh, one of their shows. So, I mean, I'm looking at all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, as you can see, there's a pattern. And I said this before, it just comes down to where, you know, something where I'm performing. Buddy, I got to tell you, you're great. Like, I mean, you, 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 you're, you're great. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you something. This is beyond, beyond stupid right now. So every now and then, as we've been talking today, I've been looking down. I've been looking down for a second at two things, not just my notes of things that I want, I want to buzz you with, but my mother is texting me. 
So right now, now, when she finds out that you have connections in Toronto, I'm done. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm done. Oh boy. Just so you know, okay? Oh, that's funny. Next, she sends me this text. This guy is special. And what does she link to? She goes, dot, dot, dot. Look what he did for his mother. And oh, she sends yeah. me the yeah. story of you right now yeah. saving your mom. Yeah. Do you know, do you have any idea how much Italian guilt I am now going to endure because of you? Thank you. Oh, Thanks. man. That was, Thanks. I love, I love that you're Italian, though. I love that because uh, actually I'm Italian on my dad's side and my girlfriend is also Italian. And we went to Italy last year and I love genuine Italian pasta is by far my favorite food. I mean, I could like, that would be literally my last meal. You can give me some Italian pasta and a steak and I'm, Good. So, so let me uh, tell you this. We're going to get together. We're going to get together. I'm, I hope I get to meet to your, your girlfriend and she can hook you up back home with Little Italy. Next time you guys go back to the visit, there's a bunch of little places that we can connect you with. with there's a place, place we went family. out there that's popular out there. I'm trying to think of the name of it. We used to go there to get, like, I'm pretty sure you've probably been there because it's a big thing in Toronto. Mm. I can't remember the name of it, though, actually, off the top of my head. But uh, shoot, it's in Etobicoke. Oh God! Oh God! There's a couple places. Uh, there's, uh, oh my God! You know what? It's never gonna come to me because it's been you know it's been a while. I haven't thought about it, but you know I'm sure we'll message again and I'll bring it up to you know I'll be like, aha, sure. I remember. For sure, for sure, Chris, I can't thank you enough for making the time. You're so busy. You got so many things going on. Um, ah, not really. I can't thank you enough. You're, you're so. Oh no problem. Thank you for no doing problem. this. And and like we talked about before, you're gonna send me some information because I know you have some really cool things, paraphernalia things that we can connect you with. Um, oh, yeah, I'll send, yeah, I'm going to send you over that link. We got some T-shirts on sale, some Masterpiece shirts. They got a cool little play on the um, He-Man. A lot of people like them, so uh, check those out. Those will be on the link that I'm uh, sending over to you. Oh, buddy, you're amazing. I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you for everything for today. Thank you. Cool.